begins with this box. I found it in the basement of 21 Jackson Street, Little Falls, New York. Now, Little Falls is an old mill town in the Mohawk Valley. There's Adirondack Mountains on one side. There's Catskill Mountains on the other. And this is the town where my mama grew up. And then she and my dad retired and spent the last 12 years of their married life in Little Falls, New York, together. It was two years ago in October. I was visiting them. And on that weekend, looking for that box everywhere, and I couldn't find it, I started up in their attic, and then I went through every single closet in a three-story house. I still didn't have any luck, so last resort, it's the basement. It's a mud floor. You don't want to go down into it. I didn't, but, well, I started down the stone steps, careful not to slip, and at the bottom of the last step, that's where I saw this large brown corrugated box. It was a wardrobe box that had fallen over on its side. And in the dim light through the dust, I could still see in bold orange print, Neptune movers. Well, I reached in. My fingertips right away touched a round, smooth surface. There was a cord and I, I pulled gently. And out of the top of the wardrobe box, I saw the edge of that one. I recognized it. I took that box out and I just ran up the stairs. I slammed that basement door shut. I went into the living room. Mom and Dad were sitting together there. They were holding hands. They were, they were watching TV. It was a replay of the McNeil Lair news report. <laughs> and my mama, she smiled when I she saw that I had this box, but she didn't say anything. Well, I ran outside. I was really late, and I got in my trusty, I got one of those 83 GL Subaru station wagons, and I put box on the passenger seat right next to me. And then box and I, we drove. We drove eight and a half hours straight down Route 81 all the way from New York through Pennsylvania into Virginia and we kept each other company and once in Virginia I came south on 522 and right into the county here and up to Gid Brown Hollow that's where Paul and I live up to the farmhouse I stopped so glad to be home got out went inside but I left Fox in the car. In fact, Box stayed in that passenger seat for one whole week. And each day we'd 
drive around the county together, do errands, go to rehearsals. You might say Vox and I were getting to know each other. And then finally, it got to be Sunday. I couldn't stand it any longer. I drove into the center of town here and right up to this old town hall, unlocked the door. Nobody was inside. There wasn't a chair or anything. Reached into the car and took the box and we came in here together. I put that box down and that was when I opened the box up. Before I open it up and show you what I found on the inside, you've got to see what's on the outside. You see the Russics in nice bold script, but you've got to look closely. Look for what's running through the Russics. Can you see it? The scribbles? <laughs> They're mine. I made those scribbles when I was two and a half years old. And as far as I know, that's really the last time this box was open before that Sunday. Now, don't be disappointed because there's nothing spectacular in the box, but there is something special. This is the dress I really found that Sunday. It is silk, and this, this is my mama's wedding dress. My mama wore this dress in 1936. She was 35 years old when she got married. Mama, wasn't that a little bit late for somebody born when you were born to be getting married? I mean, did you, did you ever think that maybe you wouldn't get asked? Mama, did you ever think that maybe you wouldn't have any kids at all? I never gave it a thought. And you know, I don't think my mama did. You see, my mama, she had her own way of doing things. Like this dress that she wore when she got married. And the hat. My mama designed this hat, and she designed all of her hats. In our house, when I was growing up, there was a big mirror in our front hallway. Mama would stand in front of that mirror. She would put a felt form on her head, and then she'd kind of mush and squish things around a bit. Mama, what, what are you doing? I'm making a hat, Julie. <laughs> but, uh, Mama, wh what are you doing with your lips and your mouth? <laughs> Why, well, I'm making my hat. The newspaper said it was lovely, this hat, large and beautifully coral. And they said that the bride wore a pretty print silk afternoon frock with British tan accessories. And matching coral kid gloves. Now, these gloves are still soft like a baby's skin. My mama being, of course, one of those women who would only use Pond's cleansing cream on her skin. Mama didn't use anything else. Well, 
this is the outfit my mama wore when she got married. It was a Tuesday, April 14th, 1936, when Catherine Malone walked down the aisle of St. Gabriel's Roman Catholic Cathedral in New Rochelle, New York. My mama, she walked down that aisle at six o'clock in the morning. A priest came out on the altar and rang a little bell. There were 25 people scattered throughout this huge cathedral. They yawned and stretched, ready for regular daily mass to begin. All of a sudden, the pipe organ starts to play the wedding march. Mama starts down the aisle on the arm of her father and takes a brisk early morning walk. And she smiles at each one of those 25 people. They're standing bolt upright in shock in front of the church. There are two rows of Catholic charity nuns. They have these long black habits on, little bonnets clutching their face. Those nuns are so surprised to see Mama that their bonnets fall back. <laughs> Mama sees nuns have hair. <laughs> Mama's so surprised she almost forgets to kiss her dad goodbye, but she does remember. She kisses him and then turns because standing up there with his back to a stained glass window is my father, Ronald Portman. He's a tall, lean, good-looking man, dark, wavy hair, nice trim mustache, clear blue eyes. He's a singer from New York City. When Dad met my mom, this is what he really said. <clears throat> Catherine, may I call you Katie? And may I teach you how to sing? <laughs> My mama happens to be a musician herself. Certainly. May I teach you how to play the pipe organ? They agreed to work together. And Catherine and Ronald, they agreed to get married. That was April 14th. 1936. Before that day, my dad had asked my mom to agree to something else. Catherine, <clears throat> in any serious relationship, I think that there needs to be one final authority, one decision maker. Now, <coughs> I think that that authority is the man. That means the man would be me. <laughs> Can you agree to that? I'll have to think about that. Mama did. She thought about it for two whole years. <laughs> Now, during that time, she found that my dad was a very agreeable man. He was moderate in his behavior. He was a fine, sensitive musician, a hard worker. She finally told him, yes, I can agree to that. And it was after that agreement, that's when they got married 
and they started to work together. My dad taught my mama how to sing. Your mother, she's got a small voice, but she's very musical. Mama, she taught my dad how to play that pipe organ. Your father, you know, he practices every day, and because of that, he's making a great deal of progress. Like that, Catherine and Ronald, they lived in a kind of wedded musical bliss for three years. And then, on June 28, 1939, they had their first child, a boy. That's my older brother, Barry. All of a sudden, Dad changed. All of a sudden, he had an opinion about everything. Like diapers, how you wash them. Uh, in ivory snow, and then you must do them by hand, hang them out on the line to dry because the sun uh, kills harmful germs. Now, I want Dr. Barnes as the pediatrician. He's the only doctor in New Rochelle who knows enough to take care of our boy. And uh, Mrs. Manning, she'll be our babysitter. She's Catholic, raised 11 children. Uh, she's had enough experience for us to trust Barry to her. About the food, uh, Katie, I don't want anything in jars, nothing in tins. Why, you can make everything right here at home. But do you know what the most important thing is? It's fresh air. You know, every growing child must have four hours of fresh air every day, rain or shine. When it snows, this is what I want you to do. Bundle Barry up in his snowsuit, then put him in the baby carriage. Roll the carriage over to the living room window. Turn off the heat, roll up the window, let him breathe in the air. You watch our boy grow. I was shocked. I did my best to keep the agreement. I did my best to keep my opinions to myself. This went on for almost three years. And then one afternoon, I remember Barry was in the bedroom and the door was shut and your father was in there scolding him and Barry kept saying, I, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Now I knew what it was about, the orange juice that had spilled all over the Steinway Grand Piano Keys, right down through the cracks. It was your father's piano. I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Mrs. Manning had left it there. Barry had only accidentally knocked it over when he was running by. But your father was so angry. He was so upset about that piano. He just sat. That night, I couldn't sleep a wink. The next morning, I couldn't eat any breakfast. My stomach was so upset. After breakfast, that's when I told your father. I can't keep that agreement any longer. No child should be brought up in a household where only one opinion is expressed.
it was all over. Oh, not the marriage, the bliss. <laughs> you know those dreams of perfect wedded happiness. I was born one year later. I am the first child of the broken promise. <laughs> Household that I was born into had one basic issue, freedom of expression. <laughs> the dad that I met, he was big. My dad had big feet. My dad says, if you have big feet, it means you've got common sense. <laughs> and my dad had these big hands, which of course means that you are generous. But most of all, what my dad had and what my dad still has is a big bass voice. We talk on the telephone at least twice a week. I still hold the receiver out to here. Paul hears everything my dad says. Paul's in another room. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would be like to be a little kid in a car with my father on the way to a concert where he's going to be singing, so he's vocalizing, he's warming up his voice. The car windows, they're rolled up and you have no escape. So what you do is you cover your ears and you say, Dad, stop! It hurts! Never say that about my mom. Mm -hmm. Now well, she had a small voice. She was a small woman. My dad, he was so big that lots of times you never saw mom. Except when my mother played the pipe organ. There wasn't anything that I loved to do more than to go up the spiral staircase in the back of the cathedral to the choir loft because up there was the organ and my mom, she would, she'd put me on the organ bench right next to her and she'd tell me to hold on and I would because if I held on I could look over the edge of the bench like over the edge of a cliff and down below my mama's feet they were dancing I could look up like looking up the side of a mountain and going across this mountain there were these rows of keys they were like roads one on top of the other and her fingers would run across these rows of keys. And then plugs. There were plugs on the side. Mama would push and pull them. If she did, the whole sound of the organ would change. And my mama, she could push and pull the plugs, run her fingers and dance her feet all at the same time. And my mama, she made a sound and it was bigger than my dad's voice. <laughs> it was bigger than a whole choir of voices. Mama, can I play the organ? Julie, you're in church. <laughs> when we get home, I'll teach you how to play my piano. Piano? At home? Mom, that's boring. There wasn't any choice. We didn't have an organ at home. Instead, we had two grand pianos that sat end to end in our living room. There was a his and a hers. And when I was a kid, and I walked up to Mama's piano, 
the keyboard came to right about here on me. So that if I turned my head to one side and I stretched my arms out like wings on an airplane, my fingertips would almost touch the end of the keyboard. And then if I brought everything up and down, I could make a sound. It was big. It was bigger than the organ. We can play every single note on the piano, one at a time. <laughs> Just like this. the way the whole thing really happened. Well, I played the piano with my mama from the time that I was four until I was 14 years old. Every afternoon after school, we would sit at her piano and we'd have this kind of musical conversation together. We played through grades one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven of the John Thompson piano book series. We would have played through more, except by that time, I was a freshman in a new high school. My thoughts were turning to things besides musical conversations with my mother after school. And Mama, she knew this. Because one afternoon, as we're sitting there playing, she said, uh, Julie, uh, I've got a surprise for you. I've arranged for you to play at the annual high school recital. What? Well, yes. And I think Sharvenka's Polish dances will be a fine piece for you to open the program with. What? Well, yes, Julie. A concert is a good way for us to bring this phase of your musical education to a close. <sighs> Mom, I, I'm not a pianist. I don't play for people. Mom, we play for fun. I didn't have any choice. It was already in print. <laughs> I, I will never forget this day, May 28th, or the Ursuline High School Auditorium. All 700 seats are filled with squirming, screaming younger brothers, doting moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, Everybody's hot and sweaty. And I've got on this new blue Swiss dot dress with a scoop neck and puff sleeves. And up on the stage is this huge, high gloss black piano spread out looking like an overgrown black patent leather shoe. <laughs> As I walk toward it, I can see my own reflection in the side. I'm terrified. I sit down. There isn't a speck of dust on the piano, and there isn't a lick of music. You never play with music at a piano recital. Even if you always play with music at home like I do. I place my hands above the keys and I look down ready to begin. Only down below there aren't any black and white keys. It's gray. It's running together. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> My mom leans forward from her front row seat and whispers, E flat. So I look down for E flat, but I can't find it. I can't find any letter of the alphabet down there. <laughs> I'll stall. I've been to plenty of piano recitals. I've seen what they do. They take their wristwatch off and they clunk it down. I'll move the piano bench around. They'll think I'm doing something. <laughs> Finally, I can't stall any longer. I close my eyes to pray like a good Catholic girl. <laughs> e flat, Julie. My mom has said it so loud this time. I have no choice. I lift my hands up and I bring them down. Again. And again. I bring them down 16 times, 16 different places. I never find E flat, but I end with a run through the muddy waters. Jarvenka was never played like that before. <laughs> Two minutes, flat. I have to get up and face them. So I get up and I look. Only they're all standing up. They're cheering. They're laughing. They're applauding. And so is my mom. I bow. And I end my first, my last, and my only ever piano recital. <laughs> Julie, do you remember that recital in your freshman year? Do you know I think it's the finest performance you have ever given? <laughs> My mama said that to me two years ago. Right after that, I asked her, Mama, what is the finest performance that you have ever given? But she didn't answer me. Instead, my mother had a look on her face I'd never seen before. It was right after that that Mama told me to look down in the basement for the box. Well, I did stop playing the piano, but my mama didn't. My mama played the piano for 54 years of her married life. Forty-eight of those 54 years were the years of the broken promise. <laughs> Which means my dad blamed my mom for everything he thought went wrong. Like me. <laughs> dad thought I should have been a singer. Learn to use your own God-given natural talent to make a real career 
for yourself and some money. Instead, she is in the theater and that is because of your influence. That is your fault. My dad thought he had a great chance with my older brother, Barry. After Barry graduated from Fordham University, he decided to study to be a Jesuit priest. Studied 11 whole years, became a trial lawyer at the same time, and then the last year, one year before he is to be ordained, he's defending this lovely, young, intelligent woman behind bars, and they fall in love. He's, he's gonna marry that woman? He's gonna leave the Jesuits? He's leaving the church? That is because of your liberal politics. <laughs> that is your fault. I have a younger sister, Mary Jo, who at age 19 was diagnosed with the disease of schizophrenia. Now, Mary Jo is a favorite of my father's. She's got my father's blue eyes. Dad, he couldn't accept it. He still has a difficult time. If you had not taken those part-time jobs teaching people how to play the organ, how to play the, the piano, if you had stayed at home with that girl full-time, she never would have gotten so sick and because she did, that is your fault. My mama smiled a lot. And my mama kept on playing. This went on until well into the time that they had retired. My dad is now 80 years old when something happens. He has two strokes right in a row. He's in the hospital for three weeks. And when he comes home, he's a changed man. He's forgotten the broken promise. I was there when dad came back from the hospital. He was in a wheelchair. A nurse brought him in, opened the front door, wheeled him right into the center of the living room. Mama turned from the piano that she'd been playing. And dad stretched his arms right out toward her. Katie Malone. You strong-willed, independent woman. How oh, I missed you. Mama, she nodded her head, <coughs> got up, and went over to my dad and took his hand in hers, pulled up a chair and sat down right next to him. Why, if you'd come with me to Little Falls, I bet you we'd find him in the living room, sitting together, holding hands. With the other hand, Mama kept on playing. Mm -hmm. 
Now she played more slowly and more gently as the months went on, more gently and more slowly. And then one day, Mama just It was very early in the morning on July the 16th when Katie Malone stopped playing the piano. <coughs> the next day, we all gathered at St. Mary's Roman Catholic Cathedral on East Main Street in Little Falls. This <coughs> just happens to be the church where my mama had her first job playing a pipe organ. It wasn't so early in the morning this time when a priest came out on the altar and rang the little bell. And that pipe organ started to play. And Mama, she started down the aisle, only this time there were three nephews on one side, three on the other, and all the rest of us right behind her. We went down the aisle at a pretty brisk pace. Mama says you've got to play a funeral like a celebration. And inside we sang and we sang seven hymns all four verses of each one i figured each hymn marked passing a grade in the john thompson piano book series <laughs> there was poetry a mass readings from the bible and finally it was time to turn around and go back down the aisle it was then that the pipe organ seemed to play a most beautiful sound. And right through that sound came a voice, louder, clearer than ever before, saying, Stop! Everything grew silent. And in the silence, there was the sound of my dad's wheelchair. He pulled himself up to the coffin where my mom was. I have a song to sing. And this is when my dad sang this song. Katie. Alone, I'm yours alone. Why keep me waiting for you? Oh, 
To order a DVD or video of this program, call 1-800-876-2447 or visit our website at www.chiptaylor.com.